When you're researching real life creatures with the purpose of creating creatures of your own, take the time to study and sketch and copy. This is how the masters became masters, and there's simply no better way to improve oneself than to observe and then replicate. Reference will certainly be useful, especially when we're spitballing ideas, and it's the ideal way to study the real world and expand our own visual dictionary. Except that if we're training ourselves to become wellsprings of original concepts, we'll need a way of lining up our attentions beforehand. What are the characteristics of this creature that will make it familiar and believable? And what are the characteristics that will make it unique? To get there, I've come up with a list of five questions to help guide us on this journey. Who is your creature and what are its intentions? Notice I use the word who, not what. The purpose of this question is to help us gauge and define the emotional impact that this creature will have on our audience. The relationship between your audience and your creation will, after all, dictate any number of traits to follow. Humans, being social, are hardwired to read the human face for cues, signifiers of personality, temperament, and intention. Signals to help us navigate each other in the safest and most appropriate ways. To create a one-on-one -on -one connection or relationship requires some very human, if perhaps unexpected, characteristics. Let's take a quick look at how personality has factored into a few creations I've designed over the years. You'll excuse me from pulling from such an old game, but I was always proud of the feral ghouls from Fallout 3. They were frightening and gross and sad, a stumbling reminder of the horrors of nuclear devastation. Their eyes were popped and lidless, their heads bulbous and childlike on shrunken, asymmetrical bodies. They are scary, yes, but so too are they pitiful. After all, they were human once. The giants are noble shepherds, protective of their herd. The mirelurks are primeval and stupid. The mole rats are vicious and bloodthirsty vermin, and the spriggan are mysterious and elemental. My intention was not to create horrifying hitboxes that run at the player's screen and force them to jam the attack button. My intention was to create characters, personalities that inspire the players to ask more. Where did these things come from? How do they live? And what do they want from me? So, when people look into the eyes of your creature, who exactly will they see? And how will that look make them feel? It's easy to get lost in the complexity of the face, but we should acknowledge right off the bat that games rarely give us close-ups. Most of the time, we see creatures and characters from a kind of middle distance, where we're looking at their entire body. But even from a distance, we can usually discern the intentions and abilities of a creature, and that's all thanks to silhouette. Imagine being in a room, a lightless room, totally black, when the door opens. Light pours in from the open doorway and illuminates the edges of the creature standing there. What do we see? Are those edges curvy, hunched, blubbery, muscled, or bony? Horns can stab and ram. Wings infer an ability to fly. Extra limbs could mean faster and more frequent attacks. Claws can slice and dice, and tentacles suggest a boneless ability to flex in any direction. This black outlined form is your opportunity to broadcast to the audience the major biological and mechanical features of your creation. The key phrase here is shape language, the idea that the shape of a thing dictates its characteristics. In this way, silhouette can and should be an extension of personality. It's difficult to inspire a sense of grace and goodness with a jagged outline, and you wouldn't use bulbous, overflowing shapes to describe something noble. So how is your creation shaped? Is it long-limbed and sharp? Is it broken and asymmetrical? Is it spindly and hand-like? Formulate for yourself one or two adjectives to describe the shape of your creation. Be specific. Avoid using words like strong or skinny or fat. Search Google for synonyms if you need to. Learning new words is always worth it, because the more words you know, the better story you can tell. It's my belief that we should be sourcing as much as possible from the animal kingdom. No matter how imaginative you and I try to be with our creature designs, it's virtually guaranteed that nature has already done something far, far more incredible. A close examination of literally any animal on this planet can yield an extensive list of inspiring and unexpected characteristics. Sure, as character artists, we can emulate the big, jagged teeth of an alligator, but can we describe the way fat hangs on its flanks and around its neck? We can render the long tail of a dragonfly, but can we emulate the mathematical precision of its helicopter body? And we can sculpt every tentacle of an octopus, but can we convey the sensitive textural balance of its frilly exterior and its more rubbery bits? These subtle characteristics can be difficult to identify and even more difficult to capture. But if we're studious and patient, then our end result will appear more informed and more genuine than anything we ourselves can dream up. These subtle details won't be the headliners of our creation, but they will sell our creation on a much deeper, more believable level.
Animals, every one of them, down to the tiniest and most horrid looking, are gifts to artists like ourselves, and studying them is absolutely vital to our development. The shape of a thing tells us a great deal about size and ability, and in dark or adverse lighting conditions, color, value, and pattern fade away into irrelevance. But don't sleep on these vital aspects of creature design. I've seen a ton of unbelievable sculpting portfolios out there, but when those artists fail to showcase any ability with color, value, and pattern, then honestly their creations sort of just fade into the background. A great texture adds so much, but it doesn't have to be complex. In fact, I would argue that it shouldn't be. Simplicity is the key to making something iconic. Think of the kaiju in Pacific Rim. Their largely reptilian exteriors are realistic in the extreme, in that they are dark and muted and mostly one color, but they would not be kaiju without the glowing lines and symbols that cover them. Or think of the xenomorph, H.R. Geiger's alien, onyx black with just a touch of silver. These schemes of color, value, and pattern are very simple, very easy to reproduce, and impossible to forget, but they are so iconic that it would be almost impossible to slap those schemes on other creations and not have someone notice. Like Silhouette, color and value can be used to inform our audience about our creation. Bright, saturated colors could tell us that the creature is tropical or poisonous. Brown, earthy tones feel natural, whereas extremely pale tones can create a skeletal, ghostly, or unnatural effect. Dark colors affect our ability to read specifics, creating mystery. And black, like the kind used on the xenomorph, lends power and emphasis to the silhouette. Pink colors create a raw, tender feeling, and flesh tones flirt with the so-called uncanny valley. They tell our audience that this creature is more like us than perhaps we care to think about. Shine, too, if we're counting that as part of our texture, creates a sense of touchability, of roughness, of lusciousness, or sliminess. Let's not forget that borrowing from the real world, which you absolutely should do, can be used to forge a real-life link in the minds of your audience. Use what they know and it will trigger an association. But keep in mind that this association cuts both ways. If the xenomorph had the coloring of a tropical fish, for instance, or of a cow, then we might not be quite as terrified. As you may have guessed already, I have little interest in running you through the common technical pipelines used to paint or sculpt creatures, because you can find those tutorials anywhere. And I'm not interested in helping you become a simple manufacturer of art assets. I wanna help you create icons. It doesn't matter if what you want to make is a golden three-headed lion that flies or a tiny mouse with big eyes. My aim is to help you craft things unique enough and impactful enough to leave a lasting impression. But how does one elevate something from the simply interesting into the iconic? This is easier said than done, of course, so let's take a quick look at a few iconic creature designs from the last 30 years and explore the elements that I believe makes those things stand out most. Predator. Ah, the Predator. So many unique characteristics for us to recall about these intergalactic trophy hunters. Their build is human, their tech is advanced, their skin is reptilian and their blood, well, their blood glows. They can hide in daylight with the aid of a cloaking device so iconic that, to this day, we compare all cloaking devices to that of the Predator. These are extremely iconic elements. And yet, when it comes to its basic appearance, I would argue that there are two physical characteristics that elevate this creature from the plain cool to the iconic. The first is his hair. Behind the large plate of his skull, a plate reminiscent of a receding hairline and a large enough to be suggestive of great intelligence, he's got dreads. Well, kind of. Thickened hair bound in metal rings. Not only is this a great visual, it's an indication of civilization a certain vanity or pride, which, for an intergalactic species who thinks of humans as sport, is a most fitting character trait. And the second, and arguably the most powerful visual, is his mouth. I remember the first time the predator took off his mask. Usually, the reveal of a thing makes that thing less frightening, but the predator's mouth is awesome. It splits open from the sides, creating a sudden and violent change in both color and silhouette. Not only did this look cool, but its reveal instantly negated one powerful, lingering question we had about the predator. Yes, it could mimic the words of humans, in the same way that a hunter will mimic the quack of a duck, but could it actually speak to us? Could we hold conversation with the predator? And could it be reasoned with? The implied answer, it turned out, was no. The Fly Now, this movie might not stand quite as tall in the modern pantheon of sci-fi horror, but I've included it for a very specific reason. Unlike the Predator, 
unlike the alien. Unlike the kaiju and unlike most iconic creatures from movies and games, the fly was never meant to stand out as an immortal example of beautiful horror. Jeff Goldblum's final form was meant to evoke revulsion, pure and simple. Its freshly molted skin is raw and dripping, its limbs are malformed, it can barely walk right. The fly is not a streamlined killing machine. It is an abomination, a biological mistake that was never meant to exist. And yet the most iconic element of the fly are its eyes. They are not small and beady. They're not hostile. They're not shelved beneath those frowning brows that we so often see employed as a way to inform the audience that this thing is bad. The eyes of the fly are huge and black and glossy. They're the most human thing it has left. We look into those orbs and we can see at once that it knows how horrible it is. Even as its mind unravels, the fly is aware enough to hate itself. The elements that make a creature iconic are often found in the head and face. That's where our attentions are drawn, typically, and they're designed to catch our attentions and hold it. In the context of this course, the term iconic refers to any detail or piece of flair that is unique, memorable, and consistent with personality and purpose. If you don't yet know what iconic element you'll use to make your creature stand out, don't worry. I found that these elements often reveal themselves over the course of their design. And that's it. That's the five questions. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed that and I hope it was useful to you. I know that when I'm trying to create something totally original, totally unique, never before seen, I tend to go by these five basic rules. I think you'll see this as a theme going forward in a lot of my YouTube videos. Hint, you should subscribe now. Um, but just a reminder, this is a, a short clip from a much longer video, Chimera, which you can watch on my website uh, or on, on Gumroad. You can check out the link below. Check that out. I think you'll enjoy it. Even if you do, even if you don't, subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe uh, and ring the bell. We're going to be developing a lot of really cool content this year and we'll be developing it, me and you together. So leave a comment below if there's anything you want me to cover anything you want me to talk about, please tell me. And uh, let's get started because we got a, a long year of fun ahead of us.